What is up, everybody? It's Spiker, and in this edition of The Closing Pitch, we talk with Devin Morgan of Driveline Academy. And if you don't know what Driveline is, just Google it, and you'll quickly realize that they are a powerhouse. They have helped move this industry forward on the research and development side of things. And we have split this conversation up into two parts. We actually had 45 minutes on the docket and we went way over. And then when looking back at the footage, there was a clear line where we could break this conversation into two different episodes. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And also, please give us a review. Enjoy the conversation. Let's finish it. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Closing Pitch. My name is Spiker Helms. Across from me is David Burkby. This is a show about people, culture, and how to create a winning lifestyle. We have a guest for you today, Devin Morgan of Driveline Academy. I am a huge fan of Driveline um, from a standpoint of just the research side. Um, probably the first time I've ever seen a sports company um, really go all in on research and actually having hard data behind um, the results where it was it was more of just like a guess like, oh, yeah, yeah he throws harder now. Yeah. That's a good job. Yeah, <laughs> we did, a, we did a really good job. Yeah. And then they do the same result and then the other kid doesn't get the result. And they're like, oh, well. It still works. <laughs> <laughs> so keep throwing that ball. <laughs> but um, before we start um, and diving into the questions, um, the biggest goal that I want out of this episode is really do a deep dive um, from the teaching side, mentor side, the training side, um, but more importantly, um, from the player's standpoint and how to really deep dive into skill acquisition and skill mastery. So without further ado, um, Devin, give us a little bit of an intro on background of who you are and how you got to Driveline. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I did smash the like button with my elbow. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to get in with the gang. Um, so, uh, you know, I think first and foremost, I'm a dad, you know, like, uh, like anybody else in this country, I grew up, uh, played baseball. I loved baseball and I was done with baseball before I was 17. Um, and you know, it's one of those things in retrospect where it's like, I think the, the kind of the path of my experience in the game, uh, as an adult, you kind of go back and it's like, oh, I, I wish I could tell my teenage self to make this choice and this choice and this choice. But like, the great thing is, is that when I had kids and I was fortunate enough to have kids that are like, first of all, happy and healthy, but secondarily, they happen to love baseball too. Uh, I went into that. It's like, all right, well, now I have uh, two people who want to do as good as they can in the game. And I'm not entirely beholden to anything that I learned because I wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, like I, I think a lot of guys that get to like the highest levels of the show are very strong advocates uh, about the stuff that worked for them. And they kind of just want to like copy and paste that onto another athlete without a lot of consideration for, for how that individual athlete might be different than you. And that variability is 100% in play, even with like people you make, you know, like my kids don't move the same way that I do. Um, they're, they're just different and unique. So when I came into it as a parent, uh, you know, it's like, all right, well, I'm just going to coach little league because if, if I'm going to be driving them to practice, I might as well be there and help. And I have a decent, at least I thought, right? Like that's that kind of, uh, that acquisition of knowledge thing. <laughs> it's, it's the Kruger, it's a Kruger, like, Kruger effect, Dunning Kruger effect. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, then it's like, oh no, I really don't know anything. Um, but it forced me to kind of go like, all right, well, I have an extreme desire to do the best that I can for my kids and the rest of the kids that I'm coaching. Let me just like look into the marketplace of ideas and try to figure some stuff out. Um, you know, and that starts with like the old, you know, the old favorites, uh, uh, you know, baseball, the Cal Ripken way, uh, you know, obviously Ted Williams, science of hitting, uh, I mean, you know, the, um, the Ron Polk, the, the big giant, like baseball Bible, like you do all that stuff. And you try to go like, all right, well, like what, what seems directionally accurate to me? Um, 
and then what seems valid and what works. Um, and then, you know, somewhere along that path, I found driveline. And, and for me, you know, Spiker, much like you, like this approach to, to just like a research driven, driven process really resonated with me um, because it no longer becomes this is what I'm doing because I'm just like dogmatically attached to this idea, like religion. And it's this other thing where like, I, I just do the stuff that in this moment of time, I believe to work the best. Um, so found driveline, um, you know, dug into the blog, you know, uh, you know, the Jager sports stuff at the same time, Craig Hyatt, uh, like, I mean, all these guys, um, like on hitting Twitter back in like, Oh, nine, uh, that were like really putting out a ton of, of good content and, and driveline just happened to be local to me. Um, then I saw that driveline was doing a youth clinic and driveline's like easily like 45 minutes to an hour away from my house. Uh, but I have two children that are like, they just, man, they love the game. And my son specifically was like a little eight year old baseball psychopath. Um, and we, you know, we did the thing where you go to kind of the local <laughs> camps and clinics and you go and some of that stuff is good. Some of it's bad. Some of it is like potentially like uh, litigious like, because it's just like unsafe. Um, so it's like, all right, well, these guys are really, really smart. Let me go down there. Um, first day we walked in the gym. Um, Herbie Good, uh, who was like a really like old school driveline guy, uh, was like transitioning to be a hitter at the time and just like casually hit something like 111 miles an hour on the hit tracks. Um, you had uh, pro ball guys, uh, Dan Comstock, Max Dudo, Max Garrett, uh, Eric Downey, Eric Kozak. Uh, they were finishing the pro guy hitting group, and then the youth group started. So my, you know, my little like <laughs> seem to be nine year old son, you know, walks in the gym and he sees, you know, Dan Comstock is just like casually ripping stuff like 350, 380, 400 or whatever, and then Dan would go into the weight room and like warm up benching 315. I can't provide that type of experience to my children because I didn't play high level baseball. I'm never going to be able to check that box. Um, but what I really enjoyed about driveline was not only like this commitment to the stuff that works, but also the fact that like there's guys around there where my son can like see up close what a professional baseball player looks like. It's not something you just kind of engage with on the TV. You get to see how guys work. You get to see how diligent they are. You get to see their commitment to their craft. And like, it was just an experience. It was just so, um, so unique uh, that I essentially like changed my entire professional trajectory about six months later, I took a job working as the officer manager in driveline. And then uh, over the course of the next like six months started doing more of our youth stuff. Um, and then eventually took on the director of youth baseball role. What were you, what were you doing before that? Uh, I was running my own business. Um, I was running a business, a family business with my uncle, uh, selling camera accessories online. I have been an office manager. I had done internet sales. I've done uh, graphic design, website design, computer repair, network. Like, I've done a lot of stuff. So you did a total, like, re you did a total rehaul. Like, you did a complete reversal of your what you were going to do, and you just loved what was going on at Driveline and made the switch. Yeah, I mean, I was I was fortunate enough when I started taking my son down there to develop some relationships. And, and man, God bless those guys that were on the floor at that time. Uh, you know, Jason Nochart, who's a uh, Phillies minor league hitting coordinator, uh, Max Gordon, uh, Tanner Stokey, uh, Joel McKeithen, who's now with the Phils, and he's been promoted to, he's I think he's been promoted to their big league club. Um, Brian Leslie, who's with the Brewers. Those guys were running the driveline youth session. Uh, and, and, you know, like I said, God bless them that I was, I kind of hung around and asked questions and I, I hopefully wasn't <laughs> super annoying. Um, so that, you know, about six months later when the opening kind of came up, uh, to go in on the, like the admin on the op side as the office manager, uh, Jason Nochart, uh, forwarded my information over to Mike Rathwell, our CEO, Mike reached out. Um, we had coffee a couple of times and I kind of told my wife, I was like, I think like, I think they, this might be a thing. Uh, and then Mike offered me the gig and I was just like, yeah, we're going to change, change everything to go work at driveline. Cause it's just like, I mean, once you get around those type of men and women and that type of culture and people who are just so relentless about like trying to uh, improve their players and improve the game. I mean, I, I was already at that point, I was like probably coaching little league for seven years or something like that. Like how, how would you, how would you not want to do that? You know what I mean? Just to be in the room with those guys and get a chance to, to get better as a coach 
and learn uh, and, and kind of, and also like prove, you know, prove the stuff that you think is actually correct. And sometimes it's not, but that's okay. The first time that I ever like, saw one of your tweets it was you putting sensors on your son um and had the had the sensors on his body while he was throwing and that was the first time that i got introduced to your account and you got a lot of heat on that tweet and when looking at it when i first saw it i was like oh dang that's that's crazy and then i started really digging into it. i was like that's actually really smart because he's trying to figure out the body motion of his I think at the time your son was nine or 10, but a lot of people were like, you can't do this. This is cruel. You shouldn't be doing that to a child. It was very interesting because it goes against everything that you're taught when you're younger as a coach, like, Oh, they're just kids. You got to make sure that it's having fun, but you could, you took it a little bit step further. And I I'm assuming you made it like a game for him and be like, Hey, let's just see what, what, how it looks and every kid loves seeing their video and loves 100%. seeing their themselves. And then you put them into a 3d chart with like the different sensors, like a game, like a video game, it becomes more dynamic. And then the kid starts realizing, Oh, that's what I actually look like when I throw a ball. So can you, can you dive into that tweet and kind of share a little bit of a story on that? I'll, and I'll link this, I'll link that tweet in the show notes too. Um, I just thought it was a really good conversation starter for um, what, for player development in general. Yeah. And, and I think player development is the core operating principle, right? Um, so yeah, you know, when we first started training at driveline, you know, we would do one throwing uh, motion capture session uh, before they left kind of the program. Right. Uh, and we started uh, expanding that into a longer off season training program. And then we got a chance to do, it effectively like a pre and a post test because what mm -hmm. I want to try to know is it like not only like are we throwing harder I mean let's assume that that's going to happen and generally it's going to happen because of two things one because the driveline stuff works uh two it's going to happen because kids just naturally grow uh it, I mean that's just going to happen naturally right um but what we wanted to try to see was like are we actually throwing better you know, like that, that is really the meat of the question that we're trying to answer. Uh, the reason that we do a marker motion capture uh, assessment with anybody that we train at driveline, youth, high school, college, or pro, is because we want to quantify how are you moving right now. Um, just in a very simple sense, I don't want to have my assessment of any athlete be driven strictly by what my stupid old eyeballs show, right? Like I'm, uh, there's a lot of problems to that, right? Uh, Stuff happens really, really fast, especially when you're talking about elite level guys, man, they just move really, really fast. It's hard to see all the type of component pieces and just rely on my eyeballs. Yes, there are coaches who have decades of experience on a field and they're very, very good at that stuff. Um, the problem that can enter into that equation, though, and I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush and say that every like long term coach exhibits this flaw, but some of them do. You see one guy that moves one way, and that's good. You see other guys, and then you just kind of go like, well, everybody should move like that, right? It's, it's recency bias. Right. That's, that's what it is. It is. It's, it, it's, it's biases. And I, I, I'm, reading, I'm reading a book right now, Think Fast, um, or Think Slowly and Fast. It, it's by Daniel Kahneman, but he, it's, it's a psychology book on our biases and how we actually see things. And he talks about system one and system two, Co baseball coaches are definitely in that category of we have biases. We like what we see. And then ma majority of the time, it's mostly what we've recently see. It's not what we've saw in the past. And I think it's important to emphasize the fact that, like, I think that type of bias comes with the best intentions. You know, like if, if you see a guy that has a healthy career and they produce at a high level, you, why wouldn't you want like the next athlete that you interact with to, to kind of exhibit that same movement? I think the problem is, is that, uh, man, people are just different. You know, this is the, the same thing before, right? If the three of us, if all three of us went and threw in a motion capture lab tomorrow, I number one guarantee you I will throw slowest. Uh, but number two, I can guarantee you that the positions that we're going to get into are, are going to be different because they're specific to what we bring to the table, right? our muscular system, our skeletal system, uh, and our ability to like sequence our bodies efficiently, 
I am very inefficient as a thrower. I have like no layback whatsoever. I've separated the shoulder twice. It, man, it's just not going to happen. So my body has to kind of compensate in different ways to try to still throw the ball hard. Uh, for someone that is uh, a better athlete, first of all, but also younger and doesn't have a, a twice separated shoulder, you're able to probably move in a more efficient way. All of us just kind of like we bring stuff to the table, right? Um, the coaches, I, I completely understand the, the reason for that bias, right? Because you see something works and you want it to work for another person. Um, if you were like a big Tom Seaver guy growing up, you think probably it is, it is possible. Uh, it is possible you would look at every pitcher like, hey, man, we should just focus a lot on drop and drive, right? That was Tom Seaver's thing. He got a lot of linear, uh, linear movement towards the plate. That back knee got really low to the ground. Um, here's the problem that worked for Tom Seaver. Um, there is, uh, probably some like genetic reasons for why he was able to do that. And I don't have biomechanics on Tom Seaver. I'm also not a biomechanist, but here's my guess. We know that there's a lot of research out there that proves when guys get excessively linear in their deliveries, to some degree, it can kill a rotational velocity, which is a fancy way of saying like actually turning torso, thoracic spine, uh, rotational velocity is a really high contributor to thrown ball velocity. So if you are really, really elite at rotating, it is possible that you could have like a little bit more uh, linear movement towards the plate and still have enough rotational velocity to still throw the ball really hard. Not everybody is going to have that same like genetic lottery ticket. So if you go like every thrower should work on triple extension, it is possible that some of those kids are going to be good enough at rotating that even if they overly optimize for like the linear movement towards the plate, that they can still rotate enough to throw the ball hard. But it's also possible you have some kids that aren't like that. And, and what you're doing is you're just, you're like robbing Peter to pay Paul. We are overemphasizing one aspect of the delivery and not in consideration of what we really need is like a full body proximal to distal. This is the big segments to the small segments uh, sequence. Uh, that, man, that that is that is the way that you you have guys move most effectively, and and the way that that has to in a best case scenario that those decisions are made like at an individual level, um, because in so much as you have a Tom Seaver, you also have a Tim Lincecum, and you also have a ton of other guys that move funky and weird, and are still able to compete at a really really elite level. Um, and I think uh, you know one of the things that you guys had on kind of the notes for for kind of talking today was like. How do we, do we train mechanics or do we train athleticism? Um, the, the root problem with training kids that are like prepubescent is we really don't know where they're going to look like when they are young adults and teenagers because their bodies are changing so fast. Additionally, young kids are just generally not that great at controlling their bodies or they're not as good as they're going to be when they're out of like this peak height velocity phase where they're constantly growing and they're constantly learning how to re, re like calibrate the way that their bodies move. So, under, like understand the animal, if that's what we've got, am I best suited for that kid to go like, these are the mechanics that work for you right now without any, any consideration of the mechanics are gonna be best for that kid when they're old enough to actually refine them? Or do I give that kid uh, a very simple goal? Let's hit the target, let's hit that target as repeatedly as possible, and let's do it at a, at a level of intent that kind of reflects the way that you're gonna have to pitch in the game. Cause that's what the game demands, you know? That's what I always felt like when dealing with uh, young players is that it was Play-Doh and I could mold them however I wanted to. And then literally when they left, the Play-Doh just smushed down and then it was just done. <laughs> then, I, then they'd come back and I'd do the same exact thing. And this is when I was younger and teaching. And then finally I started realizing what you're talking about. I couldn't put it so eloquently that you did, but I just tried to gamify everything and just try to compete, get them to compete in a way to where they were training, not no, not necessarily destroying their bodies, but more importantly, trying to trying to get into the positions that I was, that I know and my, my knowledge and trying to get them into that position. They, and then later on down the road, when they get to 14, 15, uh, a lot of the players be like, oh, this is exactly what we did when we were doing when I was like back in the day. And I was like, yep, <laughs> now we can actually talk about it. Yep. And, and the way that you can kind of like level up that same concept is 
is do the same thing, train around competition, train around intent, obviously be able to moderate that intent so that we're not constantly like burning the candle at both ends, but we can put them in constrained positions or introduce different throwing implements that are gonna kind of give them that stimulus to go like, uh, this is the constrained position that you're gonna start in uh, and we're gonna kind of like see how your patterns change and adapt over time within this constraint. Um, it's, 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 it is a longer path. I will 100% uh, agree that it's a longer path and it's a very different path. But what we're trying to do again is like preserve as much athleticism as possible as these kids develop. Uh, I man, I remember as a kid, you know, like you're, you're throwing and the coach is like, well, your elbow's here. I need it to be here or here, like depending on whatever the coach is. And it's like, look, man, if I feel the grounder and I got a runner going to first, if I come back here and I'm thinking about the position of my elbow, I'm done. Like I, I am, I'm cooked. The, that is how kids are going to get yipped up and, and like, don't want to do that. Uh, what I can do is like put that kid in constrained positions and give them things like plyo care balls that are going to help them get this pattern adaptation for where, where we're going to get to over time. And in doing so, it is a longer path. I 100% agree but we're gonna get there preserving the maximum amount of athleticism possible during a period of time when kids should be free to learn how to move fast. Cause what are the consequences, right? And I like what you're saying there because you're, you're basically keeping individualism alive to where everybody is different and that's okay. And that path is a longer path. Of course you could teach everybody the same and you'll probably win more games this season, but you also might be putting half or more of your team into situations that might be detrimental to them down the road. And you don't know that yet. And, and I think the thing that, that is, that is like constantly under indexed for is that down the road path. Um, because youth baseball is played in a very specific environment with very specific competitors. You're talking about 12 and under kids playing on fields that are very small. You know, it's in little league. You've got the 46 foot pitching distance, 60 foot, uh, Bases, uh, Pony is like uh, 50, 70 and 54, 80. But that leap from those small fields, which is like typically like a 7,000 square foot in total to like a 27,000 square foot 60, 90 field is incredible. Man, it is just, it's a, it's a sea change in play space. Because this field changes so much, uh, you have to be prepared to make that transition. Um, and if you look at a place like the Aspen Institute, um, you know, they've done studies through their project play initiative, uh, mm -hmm. talking about like this drop off in youth sport participation and baseball, if I remember correctly, is like the number two offender in terms of the number of kids that we lose. We lose. It's, uh, I saw it. The, I, I looked at it the other day. Um, we actually are in a decline on the youth level and we're actually on a plateau from the high school level in the last three to four years. Um, so I, and I could talk about that for days on like I could, what I think is happening, but it, it is kind of worrisome. Like we are still a really popular sport, but at the same time, when you chase kids away from like, Oh, don't do that. <laughs> You're yeah. doing it all wrong. They're going to freak out and they'll be like, I don't want to play this right. anymore. That guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you present youth players this ecosystem where they're constantly told that their mechanics are bad. Uh, we like hyper incentivize the consequence of, the, of when they're competing as if that's really a thing. And then we also under index for like the long term skills that they need skills at scale, which is like my thing. Uh, we constantly under index for the skills that they need to compete in this different play space. And then we lose whatever it's like 1.2 million kids a year in that transition from like 12 to 14. And everybody's just like, ah, we just can't do anything. And it's like, look, man, I realize that we have to control for like the way that travel ball is affecting recreational play at the youth level. And, and that's probably a thing that we could talk about just in and of itself for like an hour. Yeah. But absent that specific issue, my whole preposition for like the last, I, God knows how long it's just like that we are, we are under preparing kids to make a viable transition from a youth space into like the play space that they're going to be in for the rest of their lives. If we keep them in the game. And if we do a better job of that, we just catch more fish. Well, some of those fish are going to be very big fish. Like 
because we're not running kids out of the game uh, when they're like 11 years old because their coach is a psychopath and, and they've just been taught to like hit like worm burners through the four hole as if that's going to play in infinity. And it doesn't because you get onto a 60 foot 90 or 60, 90 field. And now the kid that plays second base on the, on the varsity team, well, he was a shortstop. He was at shortstop on that little league team for, for as long as he was. Now he's playing. Now he's playing in two. That's an easy out Four three. You're done. Uh, because we just never kind of give, give kids a stimulus that like, you should probably try to hit the ball really hard. Like, because better things are going to happen. And yes, I understand that there's a ton of layers to that and situational stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, moving to bat fast and hitting the ball hard is like never a bad thing. So why, <laughs> so why would we not embrace the opportunity when there's like really no consequences to speak of to actually train that thing? Kids, kids just want to compete and they want to show, show you what they can do. That's literally what they yeah. want to do. I want to show you what I can do. I want you to, they want to try to impress their peers and their coaches. Like, this is what I can do. And then when you start giving too many mechanical um, recommendations, it ends up becoming where they lose that confidence and they're like, I really just don't want to show anybody what I can do now. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what it gets to. It's tough. I, I mean, I literally, literally, this happened last night. Um, one of the kids on our 13U team came up to me. Um, and he said, uh, he's like, so tell me about the driveline, uh, swing design. And I'm like, what? Because <laughs> right? you know, we, we can bring in uh, high school and eight up players and, and essentially give them like a one-on-one -on -one hitting session where we're trying to quantify current term performance and can make recommendations on things that they could focus on to improve that performance. Right. It's not just like a one-on-one -on -one lesson where it's like, you came in and you hit for 45 minutes at like a, a D bat or whatever, and you just leave. Uh, we give you like an MLB style report to, to kind of make you understand what you're good at and what you struggle with, and then make specific recommendations to improve that. So this little 13 year old had obviously like been, you know, screwing around on the driveline webpage and he saw that swing design. He's like, well, tell me about that. And I'm like, well, okay. You know, it's, it's something we typically do for the older kids. I was like, what? so now I'm asking questions. Like, well, uh, what, why are you interested? It's like, well, I feel like I haven't got a good barrel in two weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, to, to your exact point, he, that kid wants to walk out of our hitting sessions, being able to talk to his mom or dad or sibling or grandparent or whatever. Oh man, I hit the ball so well today. Right. He wants to show someone that he's doing well and he feels like he's not doing that right now. Um, the problem is, is that like, again, I think most 13 year olds ability to like take a lot of mechanical cueing without pulling motor output off the table is, is, is a tough scene. Uh, that, that is something just kind of research proven principles uh, suggest that when you have kids uh, getting taught in what's called like an internal cueing fashion. So again, being kind of internally aware of the configuration of your body, the way that older athletes solve that problem is by pulling motor output off the table. So uh, do I think that problem is like more or less, effective uh with like younger kids who have even worse ability to control their bodies i'm pretty sure that that's the case so i was like dude uh here's the deal man you need to keep your intention very very simple get on time move the bat fast hit the ball hard what i want you to do is we're going to learn how to sprint by sprinting because that's the path like yeah. if you look at uh you know there's this i can't remember what the twitter account is um but it's been posting like a lot of like old, um, old like uh, scout footage of like current and, current and past oh, MLB and players. MLB yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, coverage or something, or I just saw it. Yeah, yeah they just posted Andrew Allen Simmons, and um, that was the game that I was playing in, and I was in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if you if you look at basically all that stuff, other than the Mike Piazza clip, because it's like Mike Piazza like taking like really bad hacks and like a garage hitting setup or whatever. Almost all of those guys have elite, elite movement speed. Uh, like they posted, uh, um, uh, maybe it was Andrelton Simmons or somebody, one of the really young kids, like taking like crow hop throws um, from right field, throwing to, throwing to third base. His arm speed is preposterous. And he's just making these throws from right field to third, like on a line. It's like the Ichiro or the Yasiel Puig throw from, you know, years and years ago. And he was, he was just trying to get drafted. Uh, the guys that are the best in the world are generally really good at moving fast. Um, that, 
that's just that's what they do, man. And, and well, and that's what and that's what scouts are looking for. That's what they're looking for. Is I I I don't want the clean guy. I want the guy that can move fast. What yeah. what's the tool that moves fast? Is it your is it your feet? Is it your arm? Is it your barrel? What is it? If if I can point to one of those, I know that you're probably going to be a dude, and we can we can clean you up along the way. And by saying that those things are important, I'm not saying that all the other things are not important, right? By by saying that like movement speed is fast, I'm not saying that mechanics aren't important. And I'm not saying that like, you know, I'm not saying that bat speed is fast and like being able to find barrels isn't important. That's preposterous, right? Like that no one is no one is making that argument. What we do want to do is just like understand, you know, from a, a first principles approach. What do the best athletes in the world do? They're really good about having baseball specific skills at a high rate of speed. Okay. So what's the opportunity for me running a youth Academy of 220 kids. Again, I, I, if I'm not embracing this opportunity that I have with young kids, because the, the context of competition should be so insignificant, that's, that's the period of time. Uh, and then we can continue kind of like the, the longitudinal accuracy of kind of keeping that program the same. They're going to get older. They're going to get better at controlling their bodies. We can get more refined with skill acquisition. But what I don't want to do is have a kid that's like 17 years old and he throws like high seven or like low sevens. And he's like, I want to play D1 baseball. Like, hey, man, uh, somebody just lied to you if they, if they thought that that was a thing. Um, and, and the tricky part is, is that, again, because the level of competition in baseball ramps up so fast, so significantly, you could be low to mid sevens in in high school with like you know good location and good breaking stuff and probably get a ton of outs uh because high school hitters depending on where you are and depending on the competition level aren't making you pay when you leave something over the middle or they don't have movement solutions to get good barrels on stuff on the outer third etc so it's like you see these parents on like these facebook uh like travel ball recruiting groups and they're like you know, little, little Tommy, little Jane, you know, throws <laughs> 72, 76, uh, and it gets tons of outs. And I can't, I can't understand why colleges aren't interested. And it's like, because they had kids throwing upper nines, right? <laughs> yeah. they had yeah. kids throwing upper eights and their, their secondary stuff is just as good as your kid, but your kid lacks like 10 miles an hour of output. So how did we end up here? Like, what are the opportunities that we had to to not only drive skill acquisition, but drive motor output along the way in parallel with it over the last 10 to 12 years? We got a really long window with kids, but if we don't embrace that opportunity, then they end up like basically at the finish line for trying to play at the next level and they're deficient in really, really important stuff. Well, this is a good segue into um, the conversation that I, I, this, this is probably the one of the most important conversations that I've really want to hit on is what narratives about developing six to 14 year olds um, do you love right now? And which ones um, are you concerned about? Because we all see the Facebook posts on the groups and then Twitter, obviously, um, and then Instagram. What, what narratives do you like and which ones do you not like right now? Um, I mean, the one that I, that I don't like, I guess this is, uh, there's a lot. There's, there's probably a lot that I don't like. <laughs> I'm a I'm an opinionated man. I'm, I I make apologies for that. Uh, I think the one that's kind of like to the front of my mind right now is is actually related to like exit velo and hitting and bats. Um, uh, so this is going to get a little bit in the weeds. So I'll try to kind of go slow. Um, kids generally from 14 and up have to swing drop three BB core bats, right? Or they have to swing wood. Um, and that's at the same time that they're making this transition to a 60 and a 90 foot field, right? Uh, simultaneously, a lot of like the tournament activity in the travel ball space from 13U down is using the U-Triple-S-A bats. U-Triple-S-A bats, um, regardless of kind of like the, the weight, right? So uh, even if you're swinging like drop five, so five ounces less than they are long, um, U-Triple-S-A bats, that U-Triple-S-A bat um, has, is graded on what's called a, their BPF standard, right? Bat performance factor. Uh, baseball bats for, for uh, in baseball are supposed to be BPF 1.15. Softball is, is 1.2, if I remember correctly, right? Um, a one, a BPF of one is supposed to be a brick wall. So uh, these U-Triple-S-A bats are really, really, really hot. 
especially compared to most wood bats. Uh, Dr. Alan Nathan, uh, who's done a ton of like physics related research, uh, I think will say that like wood bats have on a BPF scale, it's like a 1.03 to 1.05. Um, if you have kids who are 13 years old swinging bats that are like night and day in performance between the bat that they have to swing next, we are, uh, we are not giving them an honest, uh, an honest picture of what they're performing as a hitter. Um, it is that, that, that performance is artificially inflated simply by the implement, which is why uh, you had the big guys in the room, Little League and Pony, uh, make the switch to the USA bat standard. Now, uh, at the same time, you still have travel ball tournaments that are running U-trip bats for 13-year-olds um, and you can look at like, uh, you know, some of these big showcase events and these kids are hitting homers in MLB stadiums with like these 2017, 2018, the last year before we started paying a little bit more attention to the validity of the standard. These are like $2,000 bats on the used market because their performance is so high. Uh, so I, I think the, the narrative to answer the question that I have a problem with is is this kind of you know again we're parents and we have the best of intentions for my kids right like we man uh i met a girl in a bar we made people <laughs> the love of my life right uh those two people that we made i i want them to have the most success in every facet of their life and baseball is included in that and if i have some money yes man i i have bought bats for my kids um that are that are really uh, that are, that are those type of bats, like the U trip, let's say bat. I have a U trip, uh, combat, uh, the bomb. I have, I have two combat B ones. If anybody's really deep in like the youth bat space, they're going to know what I'm talking about. Um, but generally when we're training seriously, we are training with USA bats and we're training with wood bats because, because again, that's the path. That is the thing that they need to acclimate themselves towards for, in terms of like the long term goal. Um, so like this, so I just, thing I just looked it up. I just looked it up right now. The D Marini Zen 2017. It has emojis on it. That's that ha it's on eBay. Has a bomb and a rocket emoji, and it's now going for three hundred and sixty-five dollars on a bid. And there's one person, six watchers on it right now. <laughs> and, and, and this bat is used. <laughs> yeah, that that used bat is probably going to go for like five six hundred bucks all day long. Um, and again, because you're talking about you know parents. People like me who love their kids and I want to equip my kid for success. The, the problem is, is again, just like to what degree am I selling out for this current term and not giving my kid like a, a real honest perspective of like, you know, what they're doing uh, long towards like the long term thing. Um, and it's like, you know, it's the whole it's like the the dads are like, well, if you can afford to buy a Ferrari, you should buy one. And like, sure. If I worked really hard and I could afford to buy a Ferrari, I would love to have a Ferrari in my garage. It's like this testament to what I have achieved. And like, I get that. Uh, it's a little bit different when we're talking about an implement that has a really significant impact in like sport performance, because it's just, man, there's a lot of smoke there. You know, there's not a lot of meat, but there's a whole lot of smoke. I have seen, I've seen that forever where kids go out and they're talking at a 13 and 14 new age group. And they go out and they hit 15 bombs because they're playing on small fields with these super hot, what I call trampoline bats that literally just, you can just get out front on a ball a little bit and it's out. And then they come to a high school tryout and we go, no, 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 you don't try out with that one. Here's your BB core drop three. And they're like, barely getting it out of the infield. And dad's not quite understanding. Well, you never translate it. You never taught that. There's a different swing to that. There's a different methodology to how you actually have to approach hitting a baseball with that type of bat because it's a drastic difference so my question to that dad is okay you can pay for the success of your kid at 13 and 14 you but what are you then paying for in the future right and and like and, and how do we define that success right you know uh which which is kind of a, another question um and to to full transparency you know the first time my kid ever hit a ball over a little league fence um, was with uh, a, a 2017 combat bat that was crazy hot. Yeah. Uh, it was a really, really special moment because since he was like out of, you know, since he had out of the womb, the kid wanted to hit a ball over a fence and he yeah. finally did it. And I was, I was so, man, I wouldn't train that moment for a billion dollars uh, to be able to be there for it. Um, in the last 12 months, 
uh, and, and even within that hitting session, right? He was hitting with that combat bat. He was also hitting with his USA bat. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've made this transition to where like now uh, we don't, you know, we do haven't done a lot of swinging those U-trip bats lately uh, because now we are actually in our off season program. And now he's hitting balls over that same fence with his USA bat. Uh, he's, he's 12 years old now. He's going to be 13 next year. He will, not, he will not still be playing on a field that's like 200 to 225 foot fence line. Uh, he's going to be playing on a bigger field, but he's got the ability to drive the ball 200 to 225, 250 or whatever feet. Hitting the ball hard and hitting the ball far is good. Uh, I mean, yes, you want to be hitterish along with that. You got to find a way to, to hit something hard on the backside. You need to be able to understand situations. Like again, all that stuff is important. The, the core principles of like how we develop uh, effective hitters and effective baseball players probably hasn't changed a lot in the last hundred years. Uh, or in terms of like the intention of what we're trying to get, the differences of the methodology of how we get there and what we're trying to do with the driveline Academy and our approach to youth baseball is again, like embrace this kind of really singular opportunity you have before the level of competition ramps up. So how, do, how does a parent really dissect through all this? Um, because it, from uh, getting the right coach, teacher, mentor program, because I know there's a lot of parents out there that are like, I just want the best for my kid. And all this sounds great. Like, Devin, you sound awesome. But at the end of the day, what do I do? <laughs> like, I love the information, but what's my action item? How do I actually go um, search for this? Obviously, Google's a good, a good resource, but at the same time, I don't know what's right and what's wrong. So I only know what I know. Um, it, you know, if, if there was anything that I could change with like the Thanos, like snap, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think I would, I would change, uh, parents in this country to not have their definition of success for their child's youth baseball experience be predicated solely on wins. And it would be solely on skill development and like emotional validation. Um, uh, emotional validation. Go down that route. Emotional validation. Can you explain what you mean by emotional validation? Because I think that's a very important point. So there was a quote um, a couple of few years ago. Uh, I'm a Dodger guy. You know, Justin Turner um, has been just like a complete revelation since he got DFA by the Mets. He's been a huge impact bat for the Dodgers. Um, uh, Justin, if I remember correctly, trained with uh, Craig Wallenbrock um, and, and really just changed his approach at the plate. And there was a quote from a couple of few years ago where he was like, if I went 0 for 3 on the day, but I had three hard hit balls, I think, I can't remember if he said three hard hit balls or three hard hit balls in the year. He was like, I feel like that's a good day. Um, if you, Pete Rose probably wouldn't give you that quote. You know, like, like guys of kind of that era were really defined by like box score outcome. Um, and like uh, this game, I have to have to produce uh, and I'm going to kind of do anything I can to check that box. And I'm not saying that that production is bad. What I'm saying is, is that Justin Turner, I think what I take away from that quote is he has a little bit more runway for the way that he's kind of understanding his performance, right? If he's hitting the ball hard, I think that can tell you a couple different things, right? Uh, pitch selection is probably good. Approach is good. Movement and mechanics are good. Uh, output was good. Uh, and what essentially he's saying is that, like, look, if, if I know that I do that repeatedly enough, the ball's going to find a gap. It's either going to find a gap or it's going to go over a fence. Good things are going to happen, even though I didn't produce anything that shows up uh, uh, in the box score. That, to me, is like the adult version of emotional validation, right? You went out to the field, you competed, and yes, you did not check a box in the box score, but you felt really good about the stuff that you could control. That's what you can control as a hitter. The, the pitches that I hit at, the approach that I take, and, and putting myself in a position to succeed. And there is uh, several landfills worth of data at the MLB side that just prove that, like, hitting the ball hard is good. Hitting the ball hard produces better outcomes at, at the elite level, right? For the youth side, uh, I think oftentimes as parents, we tend to, like, evaluate our our player in our youth team experience the same way we think about like the local MLB franchise. You know, I've, I've been in the stands at like local tournaments and, and I've heard parents that are talking about, you know, the, um, you know, whatever their team is, you know, Johnny's Shake Shack, uh, you know, Burger Emporium, 11U, you know, triple <laughs> black, team. diamond, onyx elite. Uh, 
elite. elite. It has to be. It has to have elite in it. If it's elite, you know it's legit. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's how you know. That's that's you know it's like uh, anyway. Uh, and I've heard parents that kind of talk about the performance of this team of prepubescent children, who are like some of them are like within twelve to twenty four months of getting uh, removed from getting like bedtime stories. <laughs> and they're talking about these teams the same way that they talk about their franchise. Oh, you know, we're just, you know, the bats are cold right now. And, you know, uh, Timmy, you know, Timmy's just lost it. You know, he's, he's, he's bad in the six hole. And it's like, these are children, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but oftentimes those children are only going to understand uh, their performance through, the, through what we communicate to them, Right. Um, you know, like, I, I mean, years and years and years ago, this was, this was a Matt Lyle quote where he was like the most, the best thing you can do, um, when your kid gets in the car after the game is go like, man, I, I loved watching you play. hundred percent. hundred percent. And, and I, I will just say, you know, all credit in the world to, to Matt being one of those guys back in 2009 that I found and just like really started to kind of think about like, uh, the way that I'm reacting to my child's sports performance, am I doing that in a way that is like emotionally considerate to them? Am I doing that in a way that like gives them validation for their efforts? Am I sending that signal from the top? Because I can talk about emotional validation for kids until I'm blue in the face, but then if my kid gets in the car and he went like one for four on the day and I'm reading him the riot act about all the things that he or she did wrong, I, I am not sending signals in consideration of me wanting for that kid to be, feel validated. Um, Would you say it's picking out one thing that they did really good, no matter if it was a play on the field or them being the first one out of the dugout or them hustling down the line? Would you say that that's what you mean by like emotional validation? It's like, hey, at least give them one thing that's that, hey, you did awesome at this. <laughs> To listen to the second part of the Devin Morgan interview, it'll be releasing next week. If it is already past that time, it's past 2021. It's already there for you. So go ahead and switch over to that podcast episode and we hope you enjoy it. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and give us a review. You might not think it helps, but it does. It helps out a ton. So please give us a review and subscribe to the channel. Thanks and talk with you guys soon.